His name is Sam Houston. Most of us are from Wisconsin, so it might not mean a lot. Uh, Not too surprising, he's a historical figure from the state of Texas, Houston, Texas. Maybe you know, have heard of Sam Houston Military Base. Sam Houston, a pretty important part in that state's history, uh, played a big role in the Texas Revolution um, as the first president of the Republic of Texas. But there's a lesser known story about him, and that's what I want to talk about briefly this morning. Um, Sam Houston um, wasn't a Christian right away in his life. He actually led a pretty colorful life during these early years. When he was a younger guy, his nickname was Big Drunk. Uh, He married, it said, a a good Baptist lady named Margaret. And Margaret, not too surprising, wanted Sam to change his ways. And he did. At age 61, the story goes that he was baptized. uh, And the preacher that baptized him was the president of Baylor University. And uh, the preacher wanted to make a big impact after baptizing Sam. And so he said, Sam, now all of your sins are washed away. To which Sam Houston replied, God help the fish. But before he was baptized, the preacher noticed a chain and watch on him. He said, you might want to put that aside because, you know, you're in a river and get immersed. And then the preacher noticed his wallet in his back pocket And he said, Sam, give that to the man too. To which it is said that Sam said, no, pastor, that needs to be baptized too. I think when it comes to generosity, it's where the rubber hits the road. Right? It was our money. And here's why. There's not a day that goes by where money is not, at the very least, on our mind, right? You put gas in the car, you're buying groceries, you're paying the bills. For a lot of people, they're worrying about money, right? You have to pay your mortgage, right? Your whole life doesn't revolve around money, but without money, without a source of income, it is very difficult to live. And here's the truth from Scripture that we've heard all week, or last couple weeks, that God wants us to be generous, to lead a generous life. That also means then that God wants us to be generous with our money. And I think it's sometimes with that statement is that Christians stop listening. There's a lot of reasons for it, but the church has kind of had this push and pull when it comes to generosity and when it comes to money. And this morning, we're not going to see the Apostle Paul tell us that we all need to baptize our wallets. That's slightly foolish. But the Apostle Paul is going to talk about planning and prioritizing when it comes to God's gift of money. And if you look at those words, and we look at his words today, at the, this is the end of his uh, giving letter when he was uh, seeking funds for famine relief in Jerusalem. Remember, the last couple of weeks, the one thing we always have to remember are two things. It's our definition of a generous life, right? A generous life is a, a, life is a way of living marked by regular giving. And we have to also remember why uh, we are generous. Because generosity is nothing to do with amount. Generosity is always, when it comes to Scripture, God says it's always about your motive. It's always from the heart. And our motive is the gospel. And so now the Apostle Paul, as he's closing out this letter on generosity, there was something there that made Paul think there is an issue with the offering. And it never really specifies exactly what it is. And you remember that Paul goes to great lengths not to command generosity, but this is supposed to be from the heart and that he wants ever to be sure of that. But there obviously was something that was stopping the people from finishing this gift. And I think that there's a really true statement that we talked about in the first week, that we all desire to be generous. We all want to be considered generous. But at the same time, I do think that for a lot of people, the desire and the want 
is tough to put into action. That's what Paul focused on in our reading today. Look what he says. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it's written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The desire, for whatever reason, wasn't being matched with action. And so Paul is both giving encouragement and trying to help them uh, combat maybe some of the fears they have about their generosity. And he starts with this encouragement. He says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. It's not a surprising truth. If you are planting a crop and you throw a little bit of seed out there, you can expect a little bit of crop. If you throw a lot of seed out, everything being equal, weather being fine, you can expect a very abundant crop. But you can guarantee this, right? That if I sow a little bit of seed, I will not get an abundant crop. A little bit of seed under best case scenario means a little bit of crop. And so that's Paul as he's talking about generosity, right? You sow generosity, you do it abundantly, and you can expect this harvest of righteousness. And Paul kind of alludes to what that means. He says harvest of righteousness. He says this, as it's written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. So that was the whole point of this collection. We are raising funds for those people that are starving in Jerusalem. And so if we're able to to give generously, you will see this amazing harvest through your generous giving. But I do think they were a little afraid. And I think this is what happens when it comes to generosity. One of the biggest fears that we all have, especially when it comes to money, what if I don't have enough? What if I can't pay my bills? What if I'm going to need it someday? Right? And a lot depends on your past and your past experiences by how much that fear takes control over you. But notice what the Apostle Paul talks about when it comes to fear of this. He says this, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Every Sunday we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And when Martin Luther was talking about this prayer, he said, God surely answers that prayer even without our asking. Right? If you pray for daily bread this week, or if you forget to pray Lord's Prayer for a month, you haven't starved because you didn't ask God. And so you think about this. When it comes to your needs, food and clothing and shelter, were you ever worried one day that you'll never eat? Were you ever worried that I have no place to live, I have no home, no roof over my head, no one to help me, no clothes to put on? I'm guessing for most everybody here, that probably is not the case. It doesn't mean, though, that I always had the gourmet meals or that I've always had the designer clothes or I've always lived in this forever home from young to old. But when it comes to needs, there's a promise from God that he will bless you abundantly in all things at all times. But what does that mean? Look at what he says. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Righteousness. 
See, this verse has been so misunderstood by many Christians, and actually in a terrible way. There is this thought in some Christian communities that if I give a lot of money, I can expect this harvest of money back. Uh, The terrible term for that is called prosperity theology. That God wants you to be rich, he wants you to be happy, and if you're close to him, then you will be rich and happy, and that will be shown by how much you give, you get a lot of money back. That's terrible theology. Think about it. When you are sowing some seed, let's say we're sowing corn, harvest comes, oh, I'm harvesting corn seed? No, of course not. That's foolish. When you sow seed, you expect fruit or a crop in return. And so what's the harvest of righteousness? Right, what's the blessing? How, how when you are har- or when you're sowing the seeds of the gospel, how can you get more blessing coming back so you can give even more generously? The more I was thinking about this, I think this is the case. As we start to give from the heart, when our motive starts to be based on the gospel, it starts to take our fist off of our stuff. And it's not that if I am generous, suddenly I can, I'll be more generous, I'll have more things to give, but from what I already have, I'm able to give more. It starts to change this idea of needs and wants, the fear of not having enough, this scarcity idea that often just controls us starts to go away because I know that God promised to give all that I need in every occasion. It says, then you'll be rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving. You see why people say that evangelism or generosity is a new evangelism? Because when you give generously, right, people see it People notice it. And the whole point of giving generously is to make an eternal difference in people's lives. That's our goal. And God says, the result in thanksgiving to him, he's going to be praised. Now, Paul could have stopped there, but he didn't. Which is interesting, right? Normally, I would think that, okay, pastor, we've talked about being generous. we talked about giving based on the gospel. Paul, wouldn't he just say, Now, give from the heart. But he gave guidelines, and he gave encouragement about how to give. And you have to go back to his first letter to this church, because that's when he began this offering. And in this second letter, something happened, and so he said this, right? Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what does he mean by what you have decided to give? Well, you have to go back to what he told them when he first asked for this offering. He says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections need to be made. So he didn't want to say, hey, we're coming in a couple months, so here comes Pastor Paul or one of his other pastors Oh, Paul's here, and so they pass the plate around, and then they take the collection, and they head off. What Paul wanted to do was he wanted this gift to be very impactful. And so notice how he is. I'll say, so here's what I want you to do. First day of the week, set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, proportionate. Right. So we're going to save this up, and then when I come, we'll have this very substantial, impactful gift. So what does that mean in keeping with your income? There is this uh, teaching that's called, from this Bible passage, it's called proportionate giving. And so proportionate giving, this is what Paul says, in keeping with income means I am to make this decision based on what I make. And whatever I decide to give, right, it's going to be based on annual income, percent giving. And so what has been discussed in the Christian community is, well, what percent does God really want? So some Christian churches will say that God wants us to give 10%. And maybe you've heard that before. It's called the tithe, tithing. And there is a truth to the statement that in the Old Testament, God commanded 10%. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, I guess, in some ways complicated. The more you read about it, it's probably more than 10%. But generally speaking, 10%. 
There was no choice. If you were an Old Testament believer, you had to give 10%. That was a law. And now the New Testament came along, right? Jesus came, and he got rid of all those Old Testament laws, so now it has changed. Where God doesn't say, you have to give 10% to me. Instead, God says, be generous. And so I think, though, the Christian community is like, oh, good, because 10% is a lot. I don't think that's what God intended. On the one hand, if you've never thought about it this way, and this is kind of brand new to you, 10% is a rather big deal, and it's pretty impactful, and you probably might not be set up in your life to handle that. But for a Christian, when we talk about 10%, they talk about tithing, it should not feel unreasonable. There is no command, but it shouldn't be like, oh my goodness, that's way too much. When I look at this chart, I ask myself the question, why did Paul do it? Right, because I think sometimes in the church, we stop at one point, we say, God loves you, he's given you generous to you, lead to you. We love Jesus, now give generously back. Why did Paul say, okay, here's some guidelines to how you can be generous? I think there was no different in Paul's day as it is today. Because life happens. Your furnace goes out. Your car breaks down. You get your insurance bill in the mail, and it's like this all of a sudden, when it was kind of going up just slowly. You start shopping for groceries month after month and you see that number going like this and this and this. Unforeseen medical bills, root canal, money you didn't expect to spend. And all of a sudden, if our giving isn't prioritized and how Paul speaks about it, then all of a sudden, as life happens, we get more afraid. What if I don't have enough And so our generosity then becomes more limited. But here's what I know is that when I make a decision based on God's gifts to me, when I prioritize that in all of my giving, it doesn't mean that life doesn't happen. My furnace still goes out, my car still breaks down, the bills keep on rising. But it doesn't affect my generosity. Instead, I look at probably different areas of my life because that area was first. And what's amazing to me, and I think we all know this, that that promise from God is true, that he will give you everything you need. They don't have to worry. God does take care of us. When I was a pastor in my first congregation, we had about 20 or or so, 25 people came to church on a given Sunday. It was a very small church. About a year, year and a half into being the pastor there, uh, went over to the church president's home. And after dinner, he told me he was going to be moving, um, which I kind of knew was happening. He lived about 35, 40 miles away, uh, so I understood that. About a month later, I went over to another member's house for dinner one evening, and after dinner, he kind of told me the same thing. This different member, he quit his job, not in a bad way, um, bought an RV. He, family, they're going to travel the United States, and their goal is to hit every state in a year. Kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, but when he was done doing that, going back to work, he saved up to do this, that he wasn't going to live in the same place anymore. And so he, he handed me a check for next year's offerings because he's headed out. And the reason he handed me a check for next year's offerings because he knew what this meant. Those two families collectively gave 60% of the church's offerings. So in a couple months, the church went down from offerings, dropped by 60%. 18 months later, uh, we sold the church property, we sold the parsonage, and God's people moved up 35 or 40 miles to the north with another church. And it wasn't because God's people weren't generous not at all. 
It's just the reality of a church. It's very difficult to keep the doors open with 20 to 30 people on a given Sunday and do ministry. What's true for my church years ago is true for Emmanuel is that our ministry is based on God's people's generosity. But what's not true for Emmanuel is I have never once thought about, nor the ministry team, nor the leadership team has even considered that we might have to close our doors or sell the property or merge with another church. Um, that's not how uh, we have to operate here. It, it is a pretty an amazing place and the blessings that God has given us as a congregation. You know that by when you come here. You know that just by what you, when you look around. You know that by the number of service that we have, by the people that come through our doors. You see that too. But here's how your generosity affects Emmanuel. Our ministry expands or our ministry contracts. Our impact is greater or our impact is a little bit less based on the generosity of God's people. And that truth from, that Paul says, I, I see it all the time. When you sow generously, you can reap generously. And what's interesting about being here is that our success or failure is not based on number of people in the door. And it's not based on the, the books, not based on how much our finances are, if we can pay the bills. Our success, humanly speaking, has, is based on the impact that we can make as God's people. It's an amazing blessing to be in that position. So when God's people give generously, we're able to reap generously. When God's people give not reluctantly or under compulsion, cheerfully, God promises for us this harvest of righteousness because we are a ministry that's fueled by a person's generosity and that generosity is fueled by the grace of God because all of us know. All of us know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And that's a generous life. Amen.